Um, thank you so much, Amanda, for making this happen. This is just such a wonderful event. It's really expanding our ideas about how all of this material culture works and and the expansiveness of uh, the interconnection of England and the rest of the continent, everything, everything. It's just so great. Um, I, I did, however, follow Man Amanda's instructions to present a general audience introduction to this subject, and I see out in the audience hardly any general. All of you are, <laughs> all of you are experts in this field. Oh well, so so bear with me. At any rate, I am sure that most of you are not surprised that I would argue that. Relics constitute one of the prime movers of medieval spiritual life. The focus of devotion on these abject objects slash remains, ashes, bones, etc., was so essential in the medieval world that the effects spill over from church into secular concerns, and they become important objects of asserting power and prompting exchange. The enduring Christian desire for relics was perhaps most clearly expressed by events during the Crusades, and today we will focus on the activities of English Crusaders and the relics they obtained at great expense from the Holy East. I will argue that Crusaders brought relics home for a variety of reasons, among them to elevate their own status, to initiate foundations that secured both worldly and spiritual status for themselves and their families, and last but not least, to redeem debts incurred for the price of their Eastern voyage. I would add that, take note of this slide and then this other, Laura Slater has recently proposed another important crusader strategy, not specifically relic related, but in the same realm, that of building architectural evocations of the Holy Sepulcher to provide commemoration and prayerful intercession for a lost crusader, recalling the empty tomb of Christ to evoke the missing body of a crusader hero. Indeed, I would argue that the interaction of medieval Western and Eastern Mediterranean worlds centers to a remarkable degree on the desire of Western Christians to somehow appropriate the holiness of the East and to bring it home. There is a long Christian history of associated activities, recreating environments with architecture, writing and reading, pilgrim travel books, and finally, of course, of bringing the actual stuff home. Souvenir stuff, ra ranging from holy dirt to stones chipped or collected from holy sites to bones, thorns, or bits of iron. What we have come to call relics proved very effective in establishing an emotional and religious connection for crusaders, pilgrims, and even for those who never left home. The wave of holy material flowing westward could be said to have been initiated in the earliest era of Christianity, by means of the Roman Empress Helena's visit to the Holy Land in 326. Helena founded churches on holy sites in the name of her son Constantine and sought traces of the presence of Christ in spaces and objects around Jerusalem. Helena's most consequential act was to reputedly find the relics of the true cross at Golgotha. Although much of Helena's activity is legendary, it is clear that beginning in the fourth century, relics of the true cross and other passion relics that is, direct material testimony to the life of Christ, came to be much desired by Western Europeans. <coughs> With her tour, Helena initiated the first great age of pilgrimage, an activity that flourished in Palestine and around the Mediterranean until the Arab invasions of the seventh century. Above all, it was the sites of Christ's life and the passion relics, the torture instruments of Christ's suffering and death, especially the cross, that drew pilgrims to Jerusalem. Furthermore, it was these relics that came to have not only personal, but also tremendous community building and institutional power. Documenting an early and extensive pilgrimage, the nun Egeria describes her sensorially rich experience of the true cross relic itself within the shrine at, um, at, at the Holy Sepulchre. Quote, a silver gilt casket is brought in which the holy wood of the cross, the bishop, holds the extremities of the sacred wood firmly in his hands, and as all the people pass by, one by one, bowing, they touch the cross, first with their foreheads and then with their eyes, and then they kiss the cross and pass through, but none lays his hands upon it to touch it. These ceremonies of devotion are meticulous and intimate, involving kissing and looking, touching with the forehead, but not with the hands. 
in part to avoid theft, as one account reports. This desire for possession of sacred objects only grows. But indeed, it could be satisfied. There were ways to take something away. Cyril, the Bishop of Jerusalem in the fourth century, distributed tiny slivers of the relic of the cross to a far-flung network of Christian friends and associates. So much so that he boasted that the wood of the cross has, quote, has from here already filled almost the whole world, end of quote. Indeed, the most desired of personal relics came to be a tiny sliver of the true cross, like the one that may have been contained in a precious syncopian in the exhibition. An encolpian is a personal pendant, and this one is from the 10th or 11th century, the central one, and I show you a few others there on that slide. The draw of the Holy East did not end with Arabic rule in the Mideast. The significance of relics of the cross and that of the crown of thorns were bolstered by legends that circulated throughout Europe about the great early medieval Western emperor Charlemagne. In fact, a figure who became the crusader's ideal predecessor. Pope Urban II, in his call to crusade, urged crusaders to use Charlemagne as a model and a popular Sanson de Geste of circa 1140, Le Pèlerinage de Charlemagne, described Charlemagne's voyages to both Jerusalem and Constantinople and claimed that even though he was offered gems and riches by the Byzantine emperor, Charlemagne preferred relics. In the famous 13th century window of Chartres Cathedral, the emperor is depicted as a model for all crusaders and pilgrims as he donates two passion relics, a thorn from the crown of thorns, which you can see represented as a sort of a crown reliquary here, and uh, a nail that he is said to have received from the patriarch of Jerusalem. Whether personal token or diplomatic gift, whether following the example of the fourth century Roman Empress Helena or the ninth century Carolingian Emperor Charlemagne, the acquisition of relics of the cross and Christ's passion become a focus of desire. Indeed, the trickle of true cross relics from east to west in the early Middle Ages swelled to a flood in the Crusader period. One historian, <coughs> one historian of the Crusades um, who shall not rename names, it's <laughs> Cecilia, uh, <laughs> argues that the, <laughs> I, I didn't put her name in here, but why not? Anyway, uh, argues that the cross as a sign um, and relic concisely represented both the motivation and goal of the crusaders. Crusaders were blessed with the cross, wore the cross emblem on their tunics, and desired most of all to bring the cross home. Other relics were also brought home. Indeed, one of the most famous Christian relics, the Shroud of Turin, can trace its arrival in Europe to the time of the Crusades. The gifting of relics by a crusader to a church upon return often served to elevate the crusader and his family. Indeed, the number of relics in Western Europe multiplied exponentially after 1204 when the crusaders captured and looted Constantinople the wondrous city with the greatest accumulation of relics in all of Christendom. At Troyes Cathedral in France, 13th century stained glass windows present a monumental commemoration of a gift deriving from the sack of the Byzantine capital. A procession of clerics carry relics obtained by the crusader Bishop Garnier de Tranel. For example, here, a choir window with a cleric holding a head reliquary. Sorry, it's rather dim but that's certainly what he's holding. What better way to advertise the presence of the Holy Land in one's home church than monumental images of the treasure in a newly popular medium of stained glass? Although the majority of crusaders were French and Belgian, and despite Robert Southern's claim that the English were not fully engaged before the Third Crusade, there is much evidence that the English participated. Most prominently, and we've already heard some of this already, Robert Curthose, the eldest son of William the Conqueror, was a hero of the First Crusade. Because of Robert's scheming, rebellion, and other conduct, he was less than regal, he found himself dispossessed of the English crown. And although he was granted the Duchy of Normandy, he was virtually penniless before his departure for the Crusades. He mortgaged his duchy to raise an army, becoming one of the many knights traveling to the Holy Land in search of success and glory, as well as material rewards. During his return voyage, Robert succumbed. I mean, sorry, no, not succumbed, he succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> I don't 
don't know why I misread that, succeeded in marrying the South Italian daughter of one of his crusader compatriots and was able to redeem his duchy with her dowry. Although relics gone mentioned in the historical record, he did gift his sister's monastery in Caen a banner captured at Antioch, which could be thought of as a relic. And despite his prestige as commander in battles at Antioch, Ascalon, and Jerusalem, Robert never recaptured the English throne and was even imprisoned for insurrection. Still, he allegedly won comfortable prison accommodations because of his status as a famous crusader pilgrim. And one of his illegitimate sons, <clears throat> achieved renown in, this, in the city of Tortosa in the Crusader Triple, County of Tripoli. So he's buried here in Gloucester in a hero's tomb, and we already heard about that all as well. As amply testified by the histories of the 12th century, the Crusades were inextricably woven into English life from the time of the First Crusade onward. As with his predecessors, William of Malmesbury grounds the Crusader efforts in Charlemagne's victories and includes an account of Constantinople's impressive relics. He erroneously claims that Robert Curthos was offered the crown of Jerusalem. Not so. Nevertheless, from his and other accounts, we can conclude that as Christopher Tyreman writes, in England the crusading ideal, quote, became a habit of mind and action to be passed down to succeeding generations as part of family traditions. For English crusaders, along with bloody battles won and glory achieved came relic riches and subsequent prestigious donations. One of Robert Curthos's Companions endowed Barnwell Priory with the, quote, most genuine relics in gold and precious topaz, which he acquired on the Antioch campaign, end of quote. Godric of Finchal, a merchant turned crusader and then repentant hermit, joyously welcomed a relic gift of the hair of the virgin from a crusader companion. And at Thorny Abbey in Cambridgeshire, a series of tiny fragments from a 12th century donor recreates a Holy Land itinerary. Bits of the True Cross, the Lord's Sepulchre, the Table of the Last Supper, Mount Calvary, the Tomb of the Virgin, the Stone of Christ's Fasting, and of his Ascension. Each takes us to a primary site of devotion in Jerusalem. And I'm just showing you a group of reliquaries that start to show this kind of massive representation of numbers of relics together. Reading Abbey had a similar set of relics, a distribution, along with those of a number of Byzantine saints that probably arrived in the Crusader area. I am showing here these sorts of displays of relic collections. The English pilgrimage site of Bron Bromholm Priory reputedly received its true cross relic as booty from the Fourth Crusade and the sack of Constantinople in 1204, although another version of the story amplified the relic as imperial, carried as a battle standard or banner, and therefore presumably captured in that way. This relic became so famous at Bromholm that it is mentioned in both the vision of Pierce Plowman and Chaucer's Reeves tale. The English king, Henry III, our friend, constantly reappearing in these stories, um, made frequent visits to Bromholm and in the 15th century, the abbey received a papal indulgence. A recently discovered prayer roll, which is what I have on the screen and is not in the catalog in my essay, just so you know, um, includes both prayers for the indulgence and a visual testament to the appearance of the reliquary, which is of course what draws my attention primarily. It's so valuable when we've lost so many of these things from England. Of course, Bromholm Priory itself is completely just, almost completely destroyed. So we have no um, object that remains, but we do have these testimonies. The cross clearly had what we call a patriarchal shape with perhaps an opening in the center for devotional access to the relic like other examples like the one I'm showing you there that survives. However, looking more closely at the multiple representations, and this is actually yet a, another, a Lambeth prayer card that survives. So we have both a prayer roll and a prayer card. Um, the cross seems to additionally have had a jewel-like faceted surface. Do you see those white lines? Um, and although that surface is also shown as permeable because all of the representations also show the cross as bleeding, miraculously one presumes, in five spots for the five wounds. I would compare it to a cross in the treasury at Monza with a rock crystal cover of this same kind of faceted nature, which I find fascinating. I'm also intrigued that this role may show different 
framing presentations of the reliquary for different feasts of the true cross. We are used to seeing prayers and indulgences written out in manuscripts along with images, but here the prayer may actually have been set up temporarily to frame the rel relic object, at least that seems to be what's represented, uh, to be integrated with the image in its presentation. Pilgrims additionally carried away ampulla, the shape of the relic, also with text written on it. The presentation of the relic is both intensely visual and theatrically varied. It recalls the East both in legend and form, and although Chaucer cast doubt on the cult, it was extremely important up until the Reformation. Uh, I think there's lots more to do with Bromholm, but I just sort of got engaged with it as I was writing this talk. Back to Henry III, who was, oops, no, there's one more picture. Uh, and there you see the ampulla with the writing on it. Back to Henry III, who was so invested in the power of Eastern relics, uh, presumably for his preparations for crusade time. Now, I have one page. Um, that he may have attempted to emulate the success of Louis IX and his acquisition of the crown of thorns by celebrating a gift of a vial of Christ's blood that he had received from Jerusalem's patriarch in 1247. Here he is carrying it in procession himself to the Royal Abbey of Westminster. The power of passion relics persisted. After his return from the Fifth Crusade, Geoffrey of Dutton secured his reputation and supplemented a history of family donations to Norton Abbey, so forth. And then I wanted to mention the relics of George, which surely came during the Crusade and are still a major part of English imagery. Um, but one last example of a relic brought back for Crusaders, again, certifies the origin of the relic by using Eastern forms. The Bar Convent Reliquary in York encapsulates a cross reliquary, revealing its distinctive patriarchal or double-armed cross form in order to assure viewers that it contains an ancient relic of venerable origin. Identified by an inscription on the reliquary as a portion of the Jerusalem cross, it was purportedly given to the first Latin patriarch, given by the first Latin patriarch of Jerusalem, Arnulfus, to a crusader named D. Shirley for his participation in the capture of Jerusalem. Even though the outer reliquary is modern, designed by the renowned 19th century architect George Goldie, it repeats strategies familiar from medieval reliquaries. I find it remarkable that such a neo-medieval reliquary espousing the ideal of Christian Jerusalem should have survived in Protestant England. A more potent example of the persistent power of crusade relics, the holy matter from the East brought with such effort and cost to churches of the West could scarcely be imagined. Thank you, Cynthia, that was a feast. Um, great. Our next speaker is, is Ava Hoffman, who served on the faculty of the Department of Art History at Tufts University from 1990 until her retirement as emerita in 2020. Um, she, Professor Hoffman has taught courses on Islamic art, the art of the medieval Mediterranean world, art and exchange and iconoclasm, and she has written and lectured on transculturation in the Mediterranean world, painting in Islamic art, and the illustration of Arabic books in medieval times. She edited the anthology, Late Antique and Medieval Art in the Mediterranean World, and her current book project explores visual and cultural exchange in the Mediterranean through a global perspective, uh, and is titled, A Space of Exchange, Art and Culture in the Medieval Mediterranean. Today, she will talk to us about, but I think it still needs to be popped up somehow. Um, good, good, good. The visual arts and the shaping of the Frankish, of the Frankish experience of the Holy Land. Hi, everyone, and I want to add my thanks to Amanda and to everyone involved in the exhibition and the conference, and uh, I better race through this because I don't have much time. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> a spotlight that currently shines on art emanates from the United States Supreme Court in the case of the Andy Warhol Foundation versus Lynn Goldsmith. The court will soon decide the question of whether or not Andy Warhol's use of Goldsmith's photograph of Prince, we all know, right, the star, Prince, uh, as the template for Warhol's own silkscreen creation of Prince on, uh, on, on the left, whether this constitutes a copyright infringement. To be sure, this is a complicated issue. To what extent 
has Warhol's image appropriated and trespassed, thank you, on Goldsmith's original photograph. Writing on the case's broader implications for art in the New York Times, Blake Gopnik noted that the practice of visual appropriation is hardly new and occurred already in the 16th century. The evidence of the church, yes, thank you. The next paragraph is probably unnecessary. Uh, the uh, evidence of the Chertsey tiles and the works explored in the exhibition and catalog support the fact that practices of appropriation in their many forms, emulation, imitation, spolia, etc., were flourishing by medieval times and even earlier. Might we frame these practices more positively than 21st century lawyers? Instead of infringement of a work with a singular identity, might we imagine instead an arena of tremendously rich and open visual interaction within a dynamic continuum over space and time from the ancient world to the present? I've argued elsewhere that mobility and exchange are at the heart of these dynamic continuities in the processes of making and circulation of the visual arts, which reveal and form connections that are much larger than the works themselves. Mobility and exchange also provide a methodology for unraveling the complexities of these works. The Frankish experience is an excellent historical moment in which to explore these issues. And uh, visual objects uh, played an active role in shaping this experience, their actions, and memory of the Holy Land. In the time that I have, I'd like to present two examples, two groups of objects. One, ivory horns carved from elephant tusks, known as oliphants, represent a type of work that would fit comfortably into a church treasury. Oliphants were high-end, mass-produced works associated with a variety of Byzantine, Islamic, and Italian centers of production. And here I'm speaking about the ones that were made in the Mediterranean because then they were copied later on as well in other locations. Carved motifs of hunt and animals enclosed in roundels are found on a sizable group of oliphants, and this is particularly noteworthy given the resonance in format of the Chertsey tile and a number of other pieces in the, uh, in the exhibition. This um, format was associated with the luxuries of courtly and aristocratic art within the region and extended well beyond it, as we saw in that stained glass in, in Chart as well. The roundel design oliphants, however, may help us to explore further the context and processes of transmission through which this pattern created meaning in crusader contexts. Scholars have suggested various sites of production for the roundel design oliphants on the Italian coast, from southern Italy and Sicily to Venice, and they've also linked the decoration of the finest of the group of oliphants to Fatimid works in Egypt. Indeed, the range of possibilities suggests a close-knit network of Mediterranean artistic centers. Significantly, the oliphants' uh, stylistic connections to the Fatimids was most likely indirect, occurring through contact with Fatimid works in other media, surprise, surprise, textiles, and ceramics too. In other words, textiles and ceramics made in Egypt may have circulated in Italian centers where they were then imitated in ivory. Textiles and ceramics were actively traded in Italy, and both commodities could have supplied readily available models for mass-produced oliphants. By the time the lusterware ceramics enjoyed popularity as so-called, um, I'm sorry, those are the, the um, I, I was behind one, uh, the textiles and the, and the ceramic, obviously. Um, by the time the lusterware ceramics enjoyed popularity as so-called bacini, ceramic dishes inserted into the walls of Italian churches uh, by this time. Uh, like most other imported and widely available Eastern Mediterranean commodities, textiles and ceramics were imitated by local artisans and then incorporated into Italian ceramic and textile idioms. The crusaders could have purchased oliphants as souvenirs in Italian ports and uh, in their cities at, on their way home to Northern Europe. 
In addition to the association of the roundel design olifants with Eastern Mediterranean luxury, their Fatimid, or Eastern Mediterranean style, was a recognizable signifier of authenticity and of memory and presence of the Holy Land. This would have had particular value for the Crusaders. In medieval Europe, the Oliphants were associated with Christian struggle against the Muslim infidels. The uh, Chanson de Roland, written down in Anglo-Norman in the mid-12th century, relates the 8th century conflicts between Charlemagne's Christian army and the pagan Muslims. Before his death, the heroic Roland uses the Oliphant to dramatic effect, first to sound a warning, then as a weapon against the Saracens. After Roland's death, the Emperor Charlemagne, using Roland's horn, leads the Christian army uh, to uh, victory and presents the Oliphant to the Church of saint Seren in Bordeaux, where, according to the text, there on the altar of Severn, the good saint, filled with gold mangans, the Oliphant they lay, Pilgrims may see it whenever they visit the place. Ascribing the Oliphant to Charlemagne and describing its use in the performance of heroic and holy acts would have seemed perfectly natural to medieval audiences. Charlemagne, as we've heard, was indeed a great hero of the Crusaders, and the popularity of the Chanson de Roland during the 12th century should be understood as acting in dialogue with the 12th century Crusader adventures in the Holy Land. The decoration of Oliphants fully supports these connections. It often contains representations of animals, predators, or prey, alluded, alluding by association to the prowess of the owner of the horn during the hunt or in battle, an illusion easily translatable in crusader terms. The recognizable roundel style of the Fatimid Eastern Mediterranean provided the Oliphants with a mark of authenticity that facilitated their absorption into the European church treasuries, suggesting both the material presence of the Holy Land and the memory of the Crusades. Regardless of where they're made, the Oliphants may be localized at the nexus of Italian and Fatimid cultural space, along the network of Crusader circulation and exchange, a network that connected the holy space of Jerusalem and the church treasuries of Northern Europe. This speaks to a definition of multiple belongings and intersections of the Mediterranean that collapse the categories of Fatimid, Italian, and European, and at the same time acknowledges the complexity of identity as both Fatimid and Italian in the creation in the expanded cultural space. The second example uh, is a group of silver inlaid metalwork pieces that were all crafted in the style and technique typical of a body of Ayyubid silver inlaid metalwork made in the first half of the 13th century. Except that, in addition to the expected visual vocabulary of vegetal designs, hunting, and astrology, there were also Christological themes. One such object is the celebrated canteen in the Freer Gallery of Art. It includes multiple representations, such as the Virgin and Child enthroned uh, on, uh, on the right, upper right there, and from top to bottom on the left, the Nativity, Christ's presentation in the temple, and the entry into Jerusalem. On another work in the group, the Christian scenes are represented in abbreviated form in small roundels with the Annunciation, Adoration, uh, the raising of Lazarus, uh, entry into Jerusalem, just trust me, and in the interior are uh, saints uh, who are uh, enclosed in these, um, in these arches in elegant arcade. Okay, who were the artists responsible for the crafts of the work and for whom were these objects made? Were the artists and patrons Christians or Muslims? And if I had to stop now, I would just say yes. <laughs> the Christian imagery stems largely from the iconographic tradition of local Christians documented in Syriac and Coptic liturgical manuscripts and paintings belonging to the Christian sacred sphere. Along with the Jewish minority, Christians living under the Ayyubids were subject to various social and religious restrictions. Nevertheless, they contributed su substantially to every aspect of culture, serving as administrators, merchants, physicians, and artists. A Mesopotamian lo localization 
has been suggested stressing specific connections with Christian Mesopotamian monasteries and with Mosul as a likely site of production. The central image on a 13th century flabellum, which is on, uh, on your left, a fan that serves as a, a liturgical uh, function in Syriac, Syriac Christian ritual, for example, has been convincingly compared to the virgin and child on the freer canteen. Whether or not these metal objects were made in Mesopotamia, their sphere of interaction was not limited to that region. People and objects traveled. The Syriac inscription on the rim of the flabellum tells us that it was made for the monastery of Dar al Suryani in the Wadi Natrun, located in Egypt and not in Mesopotamia. It is also futile to attempt to deconstruct these inlaid metalwork objects into Christian and Muslim constituent parts or to search for any single Christian Muslim encounter that gave rise to the group of objects. The celebrated metalwork artist uh, Ahmad al-Daki al-Mausili, for example, signed pieces with and without Christian themes, while the name of the Ayyubid Sultan, al-Malik al-Sali, appears on two works, with Christian themes and two works without them. Exchange of fancy metalwork between Franks and Muslims provided a way for elites to, uh, from both cultures to pursue diplomacy and to impress one another with prized possessions. The use of metalwork objects with Christian themes would not have been at all shocking to 13th century Muslim viewers. After all, they revered Jesus as a prophet, and the Christian scenes would be carefully chosen to include only those episodes acceptable to Muslims, specifically from the infancy and life of Jesus, omitting episodes dealing with his death and divinity. The coexistence of Christian and non-Christian themes on the metalwork represents the fullest expression of cultural interchange in this 13th century pluralistic society. For indigenous Syrian Christians and the Franks, these objects were doubtlessly connected to the idea of pilgrimage and represented a tangible link to the holy city of Jerusalem. By the time these works were made in the 13th century, the fire of the Crusader rhetoric had died down. The Muslims had recaptured the city and the Crusaders were reconciled to a permanent Muslim presence in Jerusalem. The Christian images that had been installed in the Dome of the Rock, which they renamed the Templum Domini, had long been removed and the Crusaders could no longer install Christian images in Muslim places. The portable arts, however, could still serve as sites for the display of visual claims about the success of the crusading mission and related aspirational claims to the monuments. The Freer Canteen, for example, depicts biblical scenes associated with Loka Sancta, holy sites. The architectural structures have been identified as either Dome of the Rock, the Templum Domini, or the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. For the Crusaders, the representation of Christian imagery on the metalwork would have signified and celebrated the restoration of the holy city and the holy land. Just as the previous installation of Christian paintings and inscriptions in the previously restored Templum Domini had done, possessing an object like the Freer Canteen may have commemorated and substituted for a monumental program. That the Freer Canteen presents a magnificent adaptation of a traditional pilgrimage flask in both form and decoration is no accident. The ampulla, which brought home, were brought home as personal souvenirs uh, of this experience that could also recreate the holiness, uh, this, uh, excuse me, this uh, object could commemorate the spiritual journey of, similar to the, uh, the one of the, uh, of the ampulla. These commemorative vessels gained meaning in the context of the Crusaders' historical memory and worldview, in which the Bible laid the foundation for the unfolding of all future events, linking past, present, and future in a continuum. With their conquest of the Holy Land, the Crusaders found their place as the successors to the biblical conquerors who purified the Holy Land. They saw themselves as the direct and legitimate heirs to the biblical heritage. Their conquest single, signaled the fulfillment of biblical promise. 
the canteen may have represented a microcosm of this world. While the Crusaders asserted their exclusive claims in the Holy Land, the visual language employed for this Crusader rhetoric was local, Eastern Mediterranean. Paradoxically, it was through this local language that the Franks enjoyed the fullness of their experience of the Holy Land. It connected them to the creativity of the diverse cultures in the region of the Eastern Mediterranean and the Italian Peninsula. I believe there is a lesson here. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, great. <laughs> Good. Well, our last speaker in this session, uh, it's a privilege to introduce Perona, Peroma Chatterjee, Professor of Byzantine and Medieval Mediterranean Art History at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, she earned her PhD at the University of Chicago, and she has published on many topics having to do with Byzantine visual culture and reception. She is the author of two major monographs, Living Icons, the Vita Image in Byzantium and Italy, 11, the 11th to the 13th centuries, and uh, a second monograph entitled Between the Pagan Past and Christian Present in Byzantine Visual Culture, just published in 2022. She's at work now on a new book about the bucolic in art and literature in Byzantium. And today, her talk is entitled The Gallery as Display Space During the Fourth Crusade. Um, th thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Anne, and thank you very much, uh, Amanda, for having included me in this uh, really fantastic uh, symposium and the exhibition. Thank you. Uh, so, water played an important role during the Fourth Crusade, and possibly in all the other Crusades as well. But um, I'm actually going to talk about the Fourth Crusade, which was the traumatic event in the year 1204, when the Crusaders laid siege to and brutally sacked Constantinople, capital of Byzantium, so-called Queen of Cities. Now, whilst scholars, uh, and I'm talking really about art historians, including myself, have studied the spaces within Constantinople that were subject to pillage, uh, you know, spaces such as the Forum of Constantine, the Hippodrome, and so on, um, I don't think we have paid as much attention to the spaces on the periphery lined by the waters uh, of uh, uh, the waters that line Constantinople and which saw um, some really interesting bits of action. So today I want to focus on two dimensions of this marine scape. First, the ways in which it was used by the crusading armies as a site of architectural and engineering feats, literally on the water. And secondly, the spectacular function of the galley uh, transformed from a sailing vessel here uh, into a space for displaying items of negotiation and the forced surrender of the Greeks. So my main primary source uh, today is the Chronicle of Robert de Clary, a humble knight from Picardy, France. And it is from de Clary's chronicle that we get uh, some really interesting, and, and to me anyway, some pretty startling details about the tactics employed by the Crusaders. Uh, it is from de Clary that we get uh, the famous description of his first view of Constantinople after he and his fellow Crusaders had breached the walls. Um, he observed that the city was filled with rich palaces, churches, great wealth. Um, but he also credited the Crusaders themselves with a certain degree of visual grandeur. For he tells us um, that the Greeks in Constantinople climbed their walls and towers to get a glimpse of the Crusader fleet, which was magnificent. Um, and in fact, de Clary claimed that the Crusaders specifically made themselves look magnificent. So it's this really nice, uh, I think, um, moment where you have invader and invade, you know, about to be invaded, looking at each other and marveling at each other, uh, looking at each other's splendor. And here I'm showing you uh, an image that uh, is supposed to be the conquest of Constantinople. And you can see one side land, you know, uh, armies coming from land, and the other side uh, a galley. So let us explore my first point about the transformation of the city's marine periphery into an architectural and engineering site. Uh, and here I, I wish to say that unlike my other fellow speakers, I don't actually have the texts here, but please uh, maybe treat this like a radio commentary. Crusaders are coming and I'm telling you what's happening, right? <laughs> so um, once the Crusaders decided that negotiations had broken down, they prepared to attack Constantinople. Huh? 
uh, with the French approaching by land, the Venetians by water. And the Crusaders turned to the Venetians for dealings with the water because the Venetians were good at it. Uh, they had intimate knowledge of this realm, according to de Clary. Under the supervision of the Doge, the Duke uh, of um, Venice, marvelous and very fine engines were made, right there. Uh, he had his men take the spars, which carry the sails of the ships. Uh, and these spars were fully 30 toises long. Toise is like six PA in French, uh, six, six feet. In, in French from that time. Uh, 30 was long or more, and he had them tied to the masts with strong ropes, and he had them make bridges and planks with them. The resulting bridges were so wide that full three knights in armor could go side by side. I don't know how fat knights were at that time. I'm sure other, but, but three of them could go. Uh, and the doge had these bridges well covered with hides and canvas, so they wouldn't bear the casualty of bows and arrows from the Constantinopolitans. Now, I would say that these activities, all this you know, working around with the spa uh, and, and you know, parts of the boats, the galley, uh, these activities of the Venetians not only transformed the space around them on the waters into a site of ad hoc, but nonetheless sophisticated military architectural endeavors, they also underscored the multifunctional nature of the galleys, which could operate on water, but could also bridge water and land with one part, the spa transformed into the very stuff of bridges and planks. It is very possible that the Constantinopolitans watched these transformations on their, off their watery borders and of the galleys from within the city walls. Now, my second point, here I've actually given my points. <laughs> you can look at them there. My second point highlights the ways in which the space of the galley itself was turned into a site of display of the most significant components of imperial rule. That is, first, the display of a would-be emperor, and secondly, the display of captured imperial regalia, including an icon of the mother of God, the most important image of Byzantium, or one of the most important images. So how did this happen? Well, now, when the Crusaders reached Constantinople, the Byzantine emperor sent to ask them what they wished for, saying that if they wanted money, silver and gold, he would gladly give it to them, which is really nice of the emperor, I must say. <laughs> Now, the Crusaders responded that they did not want brute currency, which was a lie. Instead, what they wanted was for the emperor to surrender the empire to his rightful heir, as chosen by the Crusaders. And that heir was to be Alexius Komnenos, son of Isaac Komnenos, uh, whom they held with them. The Crusaders held uh, Alexios with them. Now, the Byzantine emperor now very meanly refused to accept such a demand. How bad of him. Uh, upon which the Doge of Venice suggested the following, that the crusading fleet prepare 10 galleys, put Alexius, their elected emperor, in one of them, and row close to the walls of the city. And once there, by the walls of the city, the Doge advised that the galleys row up and down, and that they show Alexius to the people of the city to see whether they would recognize him as their overlord. This plan was duly carried out, Predictably, the people of Constantinople refused to recognize Alexius as their rightful emperor. Not only did they not acknowledge him, uh, they did not even know who he was or anything about him. But I think what is remarkable in this incident is the fact that the Constantinopolitans even deigned to engage in this diplomacy via the display of a bargaining chip, which is a human being, you know, the emperor, in a galley. And I'll come back to the implications of this at the end, end of my paper, which is coming soon. Um, the second episode, when the newly crowned emperor Murzuflis faced the crusaders at night, there's a newly crowned emperor of Byzantium, huh? he faced the crusaders at night, fought with them, and uh, evaded capture, but lost, you know. In the process, Murzuflis lost his banner and an icon, an icon which figured Our Lady, which the Constantinopolitans had great confidence in. Murzuflis let it fall, let fall the banner, let fall the icon, and basically ran away. And the French captured the image. But Murzuflis returned to Constantinople, lied, saying that he had won the battle, and said that the icon and the imperial standard were put away for safekeeping. So he was, he's, he's really telling, making up a lot of stories, like barefaced liar. Um, when this news reached the Venetians, they manned a galley. <laughs> they're, they're constantly doing things with their galleys. They put the icon high on it, along with the imperial standard, and rode the galley up and down the walls of the city. 
and the Constantinopolitans saw the icon and standard in the hands of the enemies and were very annoyed <laughs> with Mutsuflis for having lied to them for his deceit. Now, I think these episodes on the galleys underscore two things. First, that the galley itself became a space for displaying an item of negotiation, that is the emperor, the would-be emperor Alexius. And because of the nature of the galley, which is open, mobile, visible to a broad public, the Venetians could bring the terms of that negotiation forcefully and vividly from the halls of power, that is from the emperor, to the populace itself, like, you know, to, to the front of the city, to the cityscape. One might claim that the conditions of the galley made possible this drastic switch from an imperial negotiation to a sort of, I would say, public referendum, to use a modern term. And in our second episode, the galley becomes a space not for negotiation, not for simply showing off captured booty, you know, the icon and the imperial regalia, but rather the galley allows for a certain kind of communication between the invaders and invaded, that is, for showing the Greeks that their own emperor had deceived them, the Constantinopolitans, that, you know, that, that they had been deceived, and for underscoring the political and geographic reversal of prized possessions which were now at the borders of the city rather than within it. Now, borders are performative sites, and I think there's a point we might do well to explore more in the context of the Fourth Crusade. Uh, to give some modern examples, uh, houses on the very edge of West Berlin apparently displayed bright neon lights to communicate capitalist abundance to their comrades in the East, and West Germany apparently opened a nudist beach by the border with towels deliberately hanging over the fence, again in attempts to lure those in the East with, you know, uh, maybe paradisiacal fantasies of pleasure. I never thought I'd use the words nudist beach in a medieval <laughs> conference, but uh, never say never, right? Uh, and here you see you know, an image of the Berlin Wall. Um, and even today, on the border of India and Pakistan, at the site of Vaga, uh, soldiers from both sides perform a daily drill with dance-like maneuvers and a synchronized lowering of the flags of the two countries. And it's a spectacle watched with great enthusiasm by citizens and tourists on both sides of the border. Now, Constantinople uh, Nople was surrounded by water on three sides. The city was attacked by at least one faction, the Venetians, who were consummate exploiters of the pragmatic and, I would say, spectacular dimensions of water. It was literally their element. The few episodes I've discussed today highlight the ways in which, despite being positioned at the periphery of the city in belligerent circumstances, the Venetians managed to turn the site to military, political, and visual advantage. Thank you. Please, please come on up. We've got about, maybe if we borrow a tiny bit from our break, we'll take 10 minutes for questions. Uh, so I open the floor. I think we all know the routine. If you've got a question, come on up to the microphone. Or here. Okay. <laughs> Great. Is it, is it not on? That's got it now, I think, yes. Oh, thank you so much for three really fantastic, interesting um, talks. Um, I'm Sarah Guerin, University of Pennsylvania, and my question is kind of a comment for Ava Hoffman. And as I was kind of taking in all of your excellent example of the Ayubid metalwork, I was thinking about how this is one of the media, artistic media, kind of artisanal media, that almost has the broadest dissemination um, in the 13th and 14th centuries. And so the, you were looking at the Christian examples, but I was thinking both of the Courtauld purse that has kind of a Mongol um, right. um, context of reception, and then of Ray Silverman's work of the, these works being um, imported and used in ritual contexts in West Africa and modern, um, in modern Ghana. And I was just wondering if you had reflections on that as to, you know, your work has touched so much on the Mediterranean, but actually this is something that goes far beyond the Mediterranean. And if you wanted to maybe extend your um, interpretive context a bit broader around the, the medieval world for us. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, 
That's a huge question. <laughs> a huge, huge thing. Um, yes, I, I, yes is my answer. That uh, it is uh, certainly uh, global in the sense of geography, in, this, in every possible sense it is. And I think it's not just limited to the metalwork. I think it's, you know, certainly with the textiles and with anything that you can move around from one place to another. Um, I will just say that the reason that I, I kind of like to stick, uh, stick close and do more of a micro history, because uh, I, believe, I also believe that every case has to be evaluated on its own terms. So that uh, I always cringe to think that uh, there are generalizations that people will take away and that they apply to everything. And uh, I, that is not what, I, what I'm after at all. So yeah, I think it's truly, um, it's truly much more expansive and that, um, you know, and this is where it takes a community to solve all these problems. And, uh, collaborative work. I think that's really the only way that we can get there. But I, I do respect all of these uh, different uh, angles and glad that people are moving ahead in many, many different directions. It's really quite wonderful, exciting. Thank you. I don't know, did that do anything? <laughs> Hi, it's Cecilia again here. Um, this is again for Dr. Hoffman, although I have to say these are questions I developed uh, when listening to your paper that then uh, was um, in reinforced with, the, with our third paper. Um, the first actually is a question of total ignorance, and it's the use of the oliphant practically. You talked about it <laughs> sitting in church treasuries, and you know I always go to museums, and I'm always amazed by them and their, you know, yeah. their, do we know what they were used for other than treasure, liturgically, um, ceremonially, within an ecclesiastical space, how they were appropriated? So that's my You know, first, it also then. depends on how large they are, but, but uh, apparently um, uh, they've been claimed, you can, you, you can make sound with them, curators have done that, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so they could be actual horns that yeah. uh, emit sound. Uh, also, um, they are sometimes uh, thought to have held liquid, uh, wine, mm -hmm. for example, and, and other things, and just sort of ceremonial, ceremonial objects. Um, and then they do get uh, incorporated into the a treasury sphere, into the kind of holy sphere, and that, you know, I think it has to do certainly with, in part, with the, um, with the Crusades and with loot from the purported, yeah. Yeah. the purported East. Uh, but there's, yeah, I think that it's um, display. Mm -hmm. This is, these are trophies. They are, uh, you know, it depends, do you, do you, you're using a whole tusk mm -hmm. of an elephant I mean, this is kind of, or, or part of it, yeah. There's yeah. at least, there's at least yeah. one liturgical document, yeah. and I can't recall where it's from now, where it the, about it's used to mm -hmm. sound during a yeah. procession. It yeah, sounds. My, my second more, I guess, conceptual question, such as it is, was riffing or sort of thinking about the claim of these, shared, these objects that are using the shared or... Um, like uh, the visual language mm -hmm. that can encompass both the Islamic and the Christian, and mm -hmm. you talked about them as as, dip, as the sort of spheres of diplomacy and exchange, and I do wonder, and this is very sort of anti the moment, but what um, the the other context for that kind of interaction would be would be loot, a word that you just yes. used, or yes, or conquest, definitely. yeah, and the ways in which, and and this is what made me think of the third paper of the mm -hmm. the, the the appropriation. So not, mm -hmm. I mean, that designs it not yeah. so mm -hmm. much as a shared language, but an appropriation of language. Yeah, and I raise that, or I just sort of throw that out there for the different angles that we can use. Um, <laughs> to think about how to, to make sense of the image, because that has to surely be one of the other sure. contexts for what what that kind of shared mm -hmm. imagery might mean in both directions. Yes. So I, I say that yeah. just as a thought that I had while thinking uh -huh. about your paper and invite you to 
do anything you want with it, including ignore it, if that's the appropriate response. No, I, I think these were very valuable objects of loot, too, and that is why they, they could play into diplomacy, because they were considered to be of great value. Um, but yeah, I think that, that is, uh, they are malleable that way, too. And Nick. Time for a question. I, I, I just want to say that this was a fantastic panel. I really enjoyed all, all three of your papers. But I'm really, really struck with this idea of galleys as a display space. Um, that's really something tremendous to think about. Um, and it made me wonder about whether this is something that was uh, used to great effect on the Fourth Crusade, developed on the Fourth Crusade, or whether this is something that came from some uh, domestic use of galleys around Venice or around Venice's holdings. Because I remember being struck once by a description of, of from ol older Venetian history when they were first subjecting um, the Dalmatian coastline to their authority. Mm -hmm. Some historian described it as the, the annual tour <laughs> that the Doge would take around and sort of just make sure all the cities on the coastline were could, could ignore. And I, and I n never thought until you said that, that that maybe there's some special way the Doge is seen on board a ship when the Doge is kind of going around their territory. So is this something you think is happening in other contexts first, or? I was hoping that you would tell me that you would answer that question. <laughs> because I, I hadn't thought about that. I mean, as art historians, we know about how the Venetians really use uh, the sea, you know, uh, the Grand Canal and things like that. Uh, and I, I don't know if this is something, but I, I know that they had ceremonies with boats. The other thing is that the, the great historian of, uh, of, of shipbuilding in, in the Middle Ages, Frederick Chapin Lane, uh, writes about galleys in great detail, but they changed this in the late 13th century. So what, you know, so we have a lot of details about that. I'm not sure about what happened before that, but it is definitely something I, I want to now look into further. I will just say this, literally came to me. It's all Amanda's fault. I, I wrote this paper just on the spur of the moment, and I really need to do more research on it. But, uh, but, but thank you for, for the vote of confidence, if you think. And if you don't I think Amanda did to honor time, shall we? see another question, okay. Um, well, I'll just say, I just want to second what Nick just said, because I, that is exactly the thought that I had, wondering if that is a kind of um, you know, practice that's coming from, from Venice, that, that sense of uh, display in that way. And it does make me think about tents, I think, is another yeah. crusader tents, a way of both displaying and creating aristocratic space all, you know, all the way across the Mediterranean as you move there and back. Um, but this is obviously an incredibly um, rich paper, much to think about in small objects and large. So please join me in thanking our speakers. Thank you.